So I'm going to be honest with you. I was hoping and praying that Jesus would return right then. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Jesse and Amy and Mary Ellen. Amy, sitting over there playing as you sang. That's awesome. I got to let my heart slow down a little bit. If you have your Bibles open to Revelation 21, and as you're going there, it is a joy and a privilege to be back in this pulpit and have the opportunity to continue where we left off last week. If you missed it, if you weren't with us last week, I would encourage you to uh, go to our Church Center app or to our website, and you can find the message last week, part one of All Things Made New. We looked primarily at Revelation 21, and today we're going to continue that study of Revelation 21 into Revelation 22. So my objective and goal by the end of this morning is that we will, we will be through Revelation. Uh, for those of you that haven't been with us, we've only been in these two chapters over two weeks. It's just a, a short uh, little series to think about the things that are to come. And has been sung even this morning, I don't know if you've caught the theme, I think praise has been consistent and I hope that You've been praising the Lord throughout this service, and we aim to continue to do that now in his word. So if you would, uh, just bow your heads with me. Let me ask the Lord's blessing on our time, and we'll jump back into our text. God, our hearts overflow with love for you. A love, Lord, that is not, not something that we can explain by our own desires, our own deserved person or nature, Lord, we know that we desire you and love you and want to praise and worship you because you've been so gracious to call us unto yourself and to save us. You, the sovereign God, has sovereignly saved a people according to your name for your purposes and plan. What a joy it is that we can praise you. God, our desire is that the whole earth would redound to your praises. As we've even read this morning, that everything that had breath would praise you. And so as we come to this point, as we gather around your word, as we as believers seek to grow in edification and understanding, we ask that you would do a work amongst us that only you can do by your spirit. Uh, illuminate our hearts, our eyes, our minds. Give us understanding. Lord, instruct us from your word, and would your spirit do that work that only you can do? Would you save those who might be in our midst and don't know you this morning? Would you, Lord, see your saints sanctified? And ultimately, God, would you keep us near to you to that day ahead when we will be glorified, when we will be made new, and we will see you as we'll learn today. We pray all of this for the sake of Christ and his name, amen. Just want to briefly recap from last week. This will probably be the shortest introduction I've given here ever. Um, but I want to recap just a little bit from last week and, and jump pretty quickly into our text because I have a lot of ground I want to cover and glorious things to show you. Last week, as I began to say, we, we've looked at Revelation 21 last week. We saw the whole of it. And I did that by breaking down Revelation 21 into three new features of the eternal state that would give us the, the strength to, to continue to run this race set before us, to continue to press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And we saw, I hope gloriously in our text, that God is going to make all things new. And uh, we looked at it, we saw not only a uh, first feature, a new heaven and a new earth in, in verse 1, we saw in verse 2 and then uh, following in the chapter 9 to 21, a new city, the new Jerusalem, and then we looked at a new order. And in that new order, we talked about three subpoints. the first being God's blessed presence in verses 3 and 4, then we looked at God's faithful provision, verses 5 to 7. And then I kind of scampered over God's just prohibitions in verse 8 and 22 to 27. So, so what I want to do today is I want to return, I want to finish up point uh, C there, God's just prohibitions. 
and then lead into one final point and then close our time today by looking at a, an old invitation. So that's kind of the, the groundwork laid. That's where we're going. And so I want to jump back into God's just prohibitions, looking in chapter 21, starting in verse 8. This uh, final subpoint that we look at when we look at God's just prohibitions, I want to address one thing. Uh, there was a, a great sermon uh, probably five or six years ago preached by a friend of mine. Some of you remember Dr. Nathan Busnitz, who's come down and, and preached in this pulpit a few times. But he preached a sermon, uh, What Heaven Will Be Missing. And uh, I'm not going to completely steal. He had 17 points. I'm only going to have seven uh, but I do want to address and look at uh, real quickly in this point those prohibitions, those things that heaven will lack. You know, we can always think about the grandeur of something and we can think of it from the positive, what we receive, but there's also the negative, what we won't deal with anymore. And I want to do that. I gave them to you last week, so let's return to them. Look at verse 8. And I want to just kind of go through these quickly on the front end. The first thing that heaven will lack is no unbelief or no unbelievers. Look at verse 8, chapter 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who do not trust in Christ, who do not thirst for God, will not be overcomers, as Revelation has said time and time and time again in chapters 2 and 3. But they will be overcome by sin and the consequence that comes with that sin. If you look just back to chapter 20, verse 15, we see there, starting in verse 14, then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. In verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Not a politically correct position but an utterly biblical position. The part of those individuals is not in heaven, but in hell. It's not, as we've seen, God's presence to bless, that's what will be in heaven, but God's presence to curse, his wrath. It's a second death. For all who will die physically, who are dead spiritually, they will die eternally. Now, that's a weighty thought and subject. And something that is right for us to not only receive with sobriety, but also should something, be something that motivates us as believers to proclaim the glorious gospel to those who are lost. To those who are headed to that end. But notice the point here in verse 8 is that there will be no unbelief in heaven. No unbelief. No rebellion. That's the first. Verse 22. No temple. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no separation anymore. No division between God and man. Remember, the temple or the tabernacle, those were physical buildings, places where, where God and his holiness, his glory would dwell. They were meant to be places on earth where there was mediation be, between the, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. And that's why you read the Old Testament, what do you find? You find priests. You find a high priest. A high priest that could only go into the, the inner sanctum, the holy of holies, but one time a year. And if he, even as he did that one time, he did it quickly. <laughs> he did it to make an atonement for the sins of the people, but, but there was this, this, this barricade, this boundary. But in the eternal state? What a glorious truth that there will no longer be a temple. Why? Because God brings man back to personal relationship with himself, both spiritually and, we're going to see today, physically. And notice, it's not that there's not a temple. It's that the temple's changed, right? There's no temple as we've known it. The temple now, as the text tells us, is the Lord God and the Lamb. They are the temple. 
We have a, an unmediated, direct access to God. There's no longer any need, even as the, the Samaritan woman had asked Jesus, uh, you know, uh, my fathers, uh, they go here to this mountain, your fathers to another mountain. Where do we go? No, this is a, a point where there's no longer a specific place because God will be in all and will be all. Not a mediated experience with God, an intimate, direct access to, to God. And our existence will be one of constant worship. Part of the reason why I wanted and prayed that the Lord Jesus would come back as I was singing those songs is because I know that's what we're prepared to be forever, praising and worshiping God. And, and, and singing is one of those ways that we're able to, to enjoy that here upon earth and one of those ways that will continue into heaven and eternity forever. Because we'll finally be what God deserves. We'll finally be what Jesus says to the Samaritan woman that God is now looking forward to, to a day when there would be true worshipers. Worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. No unbelief. No temple. Verse 23. No need of the sun or moon. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Now, this doesn't say necessarily in the text that the sun and moon are destroyed. It just says that there's no need of their light. And it's such an interesting thing when we consider even today as we sit here in this building with giant <laughs> sun, <laughs> uh, sunroof, sunroof, skylight. There you go. Sunroof. There you go. Skylight. We got a giant skylight above us. We have windows all around us. There's all kinds of natural light. We depend fully upon the sun. Uh, a week ago, we, we had uh, the clocks got turned back. How many of you rejoiced with the clocks? Oh, I see some nodding heads. I rejoice. You know why? Because when I wake up at 545 and the sun's not up, I don't like it. I don't like that I've got to wait an hour before the sun comes up to start my day. And now I love it when I get up and the sun's streaming in through. It just makes me happy. But it's more than just that it makes me happy. What's the significance of the sun? Think of this. We, we, we don't know an existence without the necessity of the sun and moon. How long would our existence last if the sun went out today? Think about the heat that we get from the sun. Think about the light, not only so we can see, but the light that provides all of the energy source that we use here upon this earth. Think about the water cycle and climate determined by the sun. Think about even gravity that keeps our planets in a, an orbit that's stable. The moon, it's important. Not just so we can go out and find little creatures when the tide goes out, but even that tide is a, a means by which God feeds the oceans. The moon, don't know if you know this, holds us in, a, in, in the, the perfect tilt and axis so we can have seasons. Guess what? In the eternal state, the new heavens, the new earth, the sun and the moon will not be necessary. Why? Because God and the Lamb will illuminate us. Listen to what one commentator says. He says, that shining in the new heavens and the new earth is not from any material combustion. It's not, it's not uh, hydrogen turning into helium. It's not from any consumption of fuel. It's not fossil fuels being burned for warmth. No, not consumption of fuel that needs to be replaced as one supply burns out, for it is the uncreated light of him who is light, dispensed by and through the Lamb as the everlasting lamp to the home and hearts and understandings of his glorified saints. Praise be to God. Don't ask me afterwards what that light will be like and how it's, I don't know. I just know it's going to be glorious and it will be a, a beautiful, re resounding evidence of God's faithfulness and God's goodness and God's purity and God's holiness and righteousness and justice constantly given to us. We will, we will have the greatest experience of reception of that light with no sunburn, no skin cancer. Glory to the Lord. His glory will be experienced in the most direct way. No veil needed to hide it like Moses needed. In fact, as we talked about last week, everything about the new heavens and the new earth is designed to, to expand or emphasize or enhance the glory of God. And 
No need of the sun or the moon. No temple. No unbelief. Verse 24, no divisions. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Verse 26, just skip. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. As I preached before, I think here we see both diversity and unity coalescing as the people of God gather for eternity. People, as Revelation 7, 9 says, a people from what? Every nation and all tribes and all peoples and all tongues. Come together with with no longer divisions, divisions that are made and designed and emphasized by a world that that seeks nothing but their own devices will be there in a perfect state where there will no longer be those divisions. No more political parties. No more fights over who the king is. It will be clear. The throne of the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb will be in our midst. No divisions. And verse 25 says, no night. It says in verse 25, in the daytime, for there will be no night there. This may be something that we, we lack some of the significance, but let me just pull you back and think about cities in that era or period. In the first century, if you're a city, you would have had around that city a wall. A wall. And the design of the wall, the wall went all the way around the city and it would have in certain strategic points gates. And the gates allowed you to accept some people in and if you needed to, close those gates and keep other people out. We don't have those same walls, although around our little kingdoms we put our fences. And they would close those gates at night. Why? To protect the city from the evil, and that would be brought in from the enemies that would seek to encroach from, from, from darkness. But in the internal state, there will be no night. Only daytime. No night. No more darkness. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And we will experience for an eternity no threat of the cover of darkness or the attacks of enemies or a perfectly secure city. And and that explains the second part of 25. Not only no night, but no restricted access. Look at this. Its gates will never be closed. They'll always be open. There's complete security in this eternal state. No, No threat from outsiders, no thieves, no enemies. That's the negative, but the positive, guess what, is there is nothing but access to God unrestricted. Did you notice? There's, there's a, a, a wall all the way around and it has 12 gates. 12 gates, three on each side, north, south, east, west. Why? What's the, the point here? The point is that we have unrestricted access. The gates never close. Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell, what happened? God expelled them from the garden and what did he do? He stationed at the gate an angel and a flaming sword that they could no longer have access back to the Garden of Eden. In the eternal state, not just one access point, 12. And angels that are there, not with a flaming sword trying to keep us out, but welcome us in. I think the most glorious of all, though, is not just that there's no unbelief, no temple, Not that there is no night, no need of the sun or moon, no restricted access, no divisions. Verse 27, no sin, no Satan, no death. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. No sin, nothing unclean will ever enter the new Jerusalem. Nothing unclean will ever be in the eternal state. Only those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb will enter. No longer any struggle with temptation, externally or internally. No longer any battle with the flesh. No longer any temptations or sin or being sinned against. And no Satan, no tempter, no father of lies, no ultimate enemy. Why? Chapter 20 told us he's already been thrown into the lake of fire. He's done, he's gone, and with him all of his demons, all of his minions trying to do his duty. And the greatest enemy, no death. 
Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, who have eternal life, will enter in. There will no longer forever and eternity to come be any death. Notice the text says, nothing unclean, no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. No exceptions. God's clear picture that we see here in our text is that God's just prohibitions should cause us to say, hallelujah, what heaven will be lacking? I don't know about you, but I often think in the the throes of my own sinfulness, what will it be like to be before the Lord, to live in perfect communion and fellowship with Him and no longer battle temptation or sin? To never struggle against my own sinful heart. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. But it leads us to the fourth point here, the fourth sub point under a new order God's restored paradise. Chapter 22 God's restored paradise. In some ways, Revelation 22, 1 to 5, is to Revelation 21 as Genesis 2 is to Revelation 1 or to Genesis 1. If you remember in Genesis 1, and I would encourage you, flip back to Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. We'll be there. We're going to kind of go back and forth. This should be easy. Front of your Bible, back of your Bible. Front of your Bible, back of your Bible. But Genesis 1, if we remember just quickly, it's a review of God's creation work. That God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in and, and, and Genesis 2, you have a, a, a focus down specifically on day 6. There's an introduction talking about day 7 at the beginning. And then he's speaking, focusing upon the creation of man. In, in Revelation 22, there's kind of a similar thing going on. Revelation 21 kind of gives us a big overview of the new heavens and the new earth. And then in Revelation 22, he focuses in in these five verses and says, what's it going to be like in the new Jerusalem? We've seen what it looks like. We've seen what's out of it. But but what's it going to be like? And in these five verses, he, he pulls on the threads of paradise and of Eden. Some of you maybe have seen this before as you've done your reading, but I just want to want to show you there's there's so many connections and reminders from the beginning of the Bible to the end of it. Most primarily, it shows us this. It shows us that God's redemptive plan laid out in the very beginning of Scripture comes to pass at the end. The danger that we find so often in our lives is, 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 is perhaps, maybe some of you have wrestled with this, the individual that comes to you and says, Is Jesus really coming back? It's been 2,000 years. In those moments of weakness and or doubt, we can begin to question and say, well, well, gosh, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've missed it. And that's the point where we have to pick up our Bibles and we have to just go and say, wait a second. No, God's been faithful. God made promises about Jesus in his first coming and what happened to those promises? They came true. They came true to a a level of quality and detail that's absolutely unbelievable. On a donkey entering from a virgin in the town of Bethlehem? There's so many. And yet sometimes we can go, well, wait a second. Well, maybe maybe God just, you know, got those right and he's going to miss on these. Are you kidding? Your God's immutable. The God of Scripture is immutable. He's unchanging. He's sovereign. If he says something's going to come to pass, it will. Uh, Isaiah 46. Listen to this. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. Saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. That's your God. If that's not your God, you will be tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine. You will be confused by every situation in this culture that that, that builds its bastions against the word of God. 
and you will find no assurance and no confidence. But if that is our God, and it is, then we can see in Revelation 22 that which is going to come to pass. It's, all, it's as if it's already done. Do you guys realize the war's already been won? Satan's already defeated. That's, it's over. It's over. It's just a matter of time. But it's over. So as we look at the comparisons, I want to show you just a couple of aspects that jump out where we see that there is going to be in the new creation a restored existence that I will say it's not just back to Eden, it's better than Eden. It explains all that happened. You know, the stuff from Genesis 3 through Revelation 20, there was a reason and a purpose according to God's good plans to bring us to this new restored Eden that's far better. Let me show you. Genesis 1. Actually, let's go back. Genesis 2. Turn your Bible. And you get, keep your finger in Revelation 21. We're going to flip around. The first aspect I want to show you is a river. Genesis 2.10. Now... A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The Pishon, the Gihon, the Euphrates, and the Tigris. Revelation 22, verse 1. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. In the New Jerusalem... From the throne of God and, am the, and, and of the Lamb comes a river. A river in Eden, a river in the new heavens and the new earth. And we can't understand this idea of river uh, to the, the effect that we should if we don't understand the ancient reader and especially the ancient Israelite living in an arid desert climate. If you've never been to Israel, uh, there's aspects of Israel that are uh, lush and beautiful, but then there's places you drive through and it's like, wow, this is just absolute wilderness. Listen to one commentator about this understanding of a river and water. He says, even in our sanitized world where water comes from a treatment plant through dependable pipes and faucets that we turn on and off at a whim, which by the way is pretty spectacular, isn't it? We cannot live without water, even in that society. John described the scene for an ancient audience whose water came from rivers and streams and rainfalls and wells. A poisoned well in the ancient world meant that people were going to die, as did a drought. For us, we think drought conditions mean we can't water our lawn three times a week. A drought speaks to the reality and, and, and the conditions of this ancient is this river that flows out of Eden, this river that flows from the throne is a river that speaks of the absolute abundance of God. The river that flowed from Eden was a river that, that went out and, and fed all of the region around Eden, but this river flows from the throne of God and it's much better. It doesn't just water a garden. Look at the text. It's a river of the water of life, clear as crystal. It emphasizes the, the abundance and the purity of this river. I have to note that I've been to Jerusalem. Some of you have been there as well. Guess what? There is something missing from Jerusalem. There's no river. In fact, the closest thing to a river is the Gihon Spring, which you can go and, and, and walk through uh, the Hezekiah's Tunnel and have you know, water up to your kneecaps. But there's no river. But there will be. And this river, like the psalmist says, a, a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. This river that, that, that reflects on even Jesus' words in John 4 and John 7 to the Samaritan woman and to the Jews at large when he says that, hey, I will give living water. This is that kind of river. Not just, a, not just a river that, that, that feeds the grass and, and helps our vegetation. This is living water, rivers of living water. And it pictures this fact that in the eternal state, there will be a perfectly beautiful, perfectly pure, absolutely unpolluted, never-ending flow of eternal life from the throne of God for his people. 
What a river. There's also a tree. Genesis 2, 9. We read, out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in verse 16 he says, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Revelation 22, 2. In the middle of the street, on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Tree of life in Eden, tree of life in the new Jerusalem. Notice some differences. In Eden, it sounds like a tree in the midst of the garden, a single tree that Adam and Eve could eat from. In fact, they were blessed to eat from every tree of the garden except one, and it wasn't the tree of life. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But here in the eternal state, the tree of life is on either side of the river. How does that work? And and the best way I can understand it is that you picture a river that flows from the throne and it runs right down the middle of a big thoroughfare. It's almost like you've got a northbound lane and a southbound lane on either side of this river. And on the river's banks, you have trees that are growing, that are beautiful. And I would argue that what he's speaking of here isn't that it's just one tree, it's one type of tree, one kind of tree. And that the tree of life in the new heavens and the new earth is abundant all the way down the river. It's not just one tree that you got to fight through a line to get to. It's on both sides of the banks. It's accessible from all 12 gates. One glorious access point to God. Notice, it's not just that though. Notice the, the abundance and proliferation. Bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Now, your uh, copy of God's word may say 12 crops of fruit. 12 kinds of fruit. In the original Greek, it just says bearing 12 fruits. It doesn't give us crops or kinds. And so the, con- the interpreters are taking that to say, well, well, either it's 12 crops, 12 different types of fruit, apples and oranges and peaches and, you know, just put all your favorites. Or it's one fruit that's just 12 new types, cop- uh, crops every month. Doesn't matter. Don't spend your time trying to figure that out. I don't think that's significant. You know what's significant? It never stops producing fruit. Continual, abundant production of fruit. Twelve times a year, new fruit. The greatest fruit of the month club ever. But it doesn't just yield fruit every uh, every month. It also says that its leaves are of a value that is incredible for the healing of the nations. And people get all up in arms and say, oh, see, there's going to be there's going to be sickness and and illness. Uh, No, no, no. The, The word for healing there can speak of Uh, life-giving, the promotion of health. It doesn't mean that there's sickness in in the new heavens and the earth any more than the fact that God wipes our tears means there's crying or sorrow in the new heavens and new earth. The statement here is just saying there is going to be an unending vitality and strength that will come from this headway, this water, this river, and this tree of life. Life. Life Life-giving. Life-producing. There's a river, a tree, a presence. Genesis 3, they heard the sound, Adam and Eve, after they've eaten in disobedience. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Is there anything more horrific in the beginning of the scriptures than the fact that man is hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord? 22, 3a, there will no longer be any curse. Now, we have to unpack this. There's no curse. Maybe you'd say, well, wait, doesn't this belong to the prohibition section that you had? Yeah, it could. But I think it's important here because it connects to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it was their disobedience against God, disobedience of God's clear command to take the forbidden fruit and eat it as Adam, as our Our head, our representative did that. His action caused the whole human race, including you and I today, the whole human race to be cast down. It's the fall. And there were two 
curses that were given. A curse against the serpent in Genesis 3 and a curse against the ground. No longer would, would Adam and Eve enjoy their food and work without toil and difficulty. They, they were removed from the garden and now they had to go out and work for it. Like hard work for it. And now there's thorns and thistles. And now there's all the things, if you've ever raised roses, that you, you know, right? The rose is beautiful, but the thorn is horrible. They've experienced that. The ground itself resisting the labors of man. It's only by the sweat of a man's brow. Come over to my house when I'm working in the yard. My wife can tell you I sweat. And every time I sweat, cursed are you, ground. (laughs) But what was most dramatic is what Genesis 3.22 says. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man's become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out, and at the east of the garden he stationed that cherub and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Notice the language of separation. Sent him out, drove him out, stationed an angel to keep him out. Man was removed from the immediate presence of God for their own good. Why? Because if God had allowed them to remain in and eat of the tree of life, then they would have been sustained in their sin forever. And so in his grace and mercy, the action of God, he kicked them out and he gave them a promise. Because God had a greater plan. God's greater plan came in Genesis 3 verse 15. He says, and I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. That promised seed of woman would come from the line of Seth, of Noah, of Shem, a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob from the tribe of Judah, who would be a son of David, who would be the promised Messiah who would save his people from their sins. This is exactly who Jesus was and what Jesus did. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. You know why there's no more curse? Because Christ became a curse if you're in him, for you, for me. No longer will there be a curse. The cursed serpent of old would be thrown into the lake of fire, no longer to tempt or attack, no longer to deceive. The the cursed ground will be overcome with a new earth that no longer has thorns and thistles, roses without thorns. No more toil, no more turmoil, just abundant, gracious provision. And that's because of what we read next. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. I belabored the point last week. I won't do it today. This is the key to the new heavens and the new earth. If you take the time, and I would encourage you to do it, Revelation 21 and 22, 47 times in these two chapters is it talk about God, the Lamb, the Lord, the Spirit, Jesus, or some pronoun about God. 47 times. God's the heart of heaven. God's glory is the whole purpose of our existence. And until you and I understand that and realize that, we'll never live for his glory. There will no longer be any competing thrones. Just one throne. One throne. And on that throne will be God Almighty and and the Lamb. And the divine rule of God will never cease. Our perfectly holy God will dwell with glorified man for eternity in perfect communion and fellowship forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And we'll worship him perfectly. We sang about this this morning. Jesse, thank you for those songs. Praise the Lord. I know you didn't write them, but thank you for picking them. 
bless my, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's the rock of ages. Praise him. Praise him. There's a river, there's a tree, there's a presence. Last one, there's a people. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then chapter 2, verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Notice the purpose of man given in Genesis 1 and 2 before the fall. was to multiply, fill the earth, and rule over creation and to be God's servant in it. We were called to be his representatives. And and look at at Revelation 22, 3. It says, and the throne of the God and Lamb will be in it and his bondservants will serve him. I love this. That's us. His bondservants. The Greek, it's doulos. Slaves. Slaves. There's a throne, only one throne. There's one master, that's God. He's perfectly benevolent and good and just and righteous and holy. And we will be his slaves, his servants. We are his people, gathered in the new Jerusalem. All who have been bought with a price, all who were redeemed by God, all who have been purchased by the precious blood of the Lamb, that's who will be his bondservants. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And notice a couple of incredible things. One, we'll serve him. It's the same thing he got back to Genesis 2. We're going to serve him. By the way, your translation, if you have the ESV or NET or several others, you might say worship him. Because the word here can mean serve or worship, latruo. It's, it's, a, it's a word that translates both. And I think it's actually very appropriate here because guess what? How do we worship him? By serving him. How do we serve him? By worshiping him. And we'll finally do it perfectly. We were created to do it like that in the garden, but guess what never happened? It never was perfect. Perfect worship. Perfect service. But you want to know the reason we'll serve and worship him forever? It's in the text, verse 4. They'll see his face. I read this and I just, I'll be honest. I don't think I understood this verse until this week. Because I think in my mind, I had all of these texts from the Old Testament and New Testament that seemed to clearly say, man, no one can see God and live. No one can see the face of God. How can that be? And I think I I piled all of that luggage into this verse. And then I read this verse and I said, what would this verse say if I just read this verse? And they will see his face. I don't presume to know all that that means, but I can tell you what it means. We'll see his face. Thank you. This is an access. The point, guys, this is an access to God that's never existed. This is an access to God. God walked in the cool of the day with his people, with Adam and Eve, but this is different. This is face-to-face. This is a different face-to-face than Moses. This is a different face-to-face than the high priest going into the, the Holy of Holies or, 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 or Israel assembled at Mount Sinai. This is a different face. This is, this is what no unglorified human could ever do, ever look on God and live. But in the eternal state, those limitations in our glorified nature will be different. The barriers lifted, overcome, and in some way, we'll see him just as he is. I don't presume to know all that that means, but I tell you this, this means that we have an experience before us that we cannot imagine. Some of you dear saints that sit here, and you know what? The window is closing. The time that you have here on this earth, you're one day closer, as all of us are, 
And we have no clue to know when the Lord will either call us home to himself or come to get us himself. But the reality is, here's a hope and promise that you can count on. You will see him. If that doesn't drive you to the greatest euphoria and the highest levels of praise and the most glorious wonder and most glorious fascination with how can that be, I would question whether you know Christ at all. I would question if maybe our really sterile, emotionless experience of life is a hard outer shell that keeps us from experiencing the real God. You're going to see him face to face. I'm not a crier, but that should lead us to tears of joy. There's more. His name will be on your forehead. It's a mark of ownership. In the garden, man was made in his image. He was created after God's likeness, but his representatives to creation because of sin were marred. Autonomy and independence came in. But guess what? There's a day coming when that will not be. We will be his glorious possession forever, and he'll stamp his mark right on our forehead. Everyone will know whose we are. Not Apollos, not Peter. We are God's. And we'll live in this perpetual state of dependence, dependence upon God and God himself. And John, just so we don't miss it, reiterates and repeats the data to help us out. He says, and there will be no longer any night, and they will have no need of light, of a lamp, or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. I should just stop right now. Listen to J.C. Ryle. The heart of a true Christian longs for that blessed day when he will see his master face to face and go out no more. He longs to have done with sinning and repenting and believing and to begin that endless life when he shall see as he has been seen and sin no more. He has found it sweet to live by faith and he feels it will be sweeter still to live by sight. He has found it pleasant to hear of Christ, to talk of Christ, to read of Christ. But how much more pleasant will it be to see Christ with your own eyes and never leave him anymore? There's a new heaven, a new earth. There's a new city to come. There's a new order where God's blessed presence will be, where God's faithful provision will remain, where God's just prohibitions will exist, where God's restored paradise will be. We've seen three new features. There's one old invitation I have to give. It's this. There's two sides of application here because there's two people in this room here today. There are those who will be in the new heavens and the new earth and those who will not. Notice verse 6, and he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Hear me now, God's promises are true. His word is true. You either submit to it and submit your life to it and to Christ, or you are in rebellion and rejection of it. No matter how much you say you love Jesus, if you love him, you'll obey his commands. Christ's return is imminent. Over and over and over again in Revelation 22, we hear that it must soon take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Behold, I'm coming quickly. The time is near. And you say, oh, it's been 2,000 years. It's as imminent today as it was then when John wrote it. He could come today. Are you ready? (laughs) You may think you have all the time in the world, but you don't. The Lord could come tonight. Don't be like the fool who builds bigger barns and says, ah, now I can rest. And God says, guess what? I'm taking your life tonight. Don't be like the fool who says, yeah, I've heard this before. I grew up in the church. I've heard this one. I I can push this aside. Don't be that person. Because blessed is the one who heeds the prophecy of this book. That's what the scripture says. You're blessed if you hear these words, this message, and you realize that God has called you to himself and you love his appearing. And you long for his appearing. And this changes how you live, Christian. This changes how we live. 
This changes our obedience because we want to be holy as he's holy. This changes our worship. It must be pure. We want to worship him rightly. Even as we fail to do so fully, we want to. This changes, this changes our evangelism. It should. When's the last time you told someone about Christ? When's the last time you shared the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with a neighbor or a family member or somebody you knock on their door? If you can't answer that question, brothers and sisters, you are deceived or fearful. This should change our lives. It should be more consistent. What's the evidence of your life say? What kind of fruit? And for those of you that are here and you don't know the Lord, look at verse 12. I know I've skipped over others, but I'm out of time. Listen, I'm going to call you to believe. And you know how I'm going to do it? By letting Jesus speak. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to remember, render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say to you, if you're in unbelief, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. If you're here today and you have yet to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ... The only thing that's keeping you from it is your bowing of your knee, submitting yourself to Christ, repenting of your sins, and trusting in him. And he says, come. Where your destiny, whether it's the lake of fire or the glorious new heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem, it depends upon the decision, the action, the response to the gospel, you're responsible and by the grace of God and the work of His Spirit, I pray that He would do that work even in you today. Because He's the only one that can. He who testifies to these sayings, verse 20, says, Yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, God, we... We know that you didn't have to reveal to us all that you have. We know, in fact, that you had every right as a sovereign creator to leave us as rebels to our own devices, to our own sin. You had every right and would have been none in the wrong to send every single one of us to the lake of fire. That would not have been unjust or unrighteous. It would have been perfectly in character with a good and just God against rebe rebellious people like we are. And yet, God, in your grace, in your mercy, you made a way. And we stand here, those of us who have bowed the knee to Christ, knowing that we're recipients of a mercy, a grace, a loving kindness that we don't deserve that you've set your affection upon us, that you called us to yourself, that you, before the foundation of the world, elected us to salvation, that you wrote our names in the Lamb's book of life, that you have done that work that we cannot do, and we give you praise and glory and honor for it. We have nothing to boast in. We boast in you. We thank you for this picture we've seen this morning. May this cause us to boast in you even more. May this cause us to live our lives transformed as Christians. And if, God, there be any in our midst here who don't know you, please do that work that only you can do. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. All for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we say, come, Lord Jesus. All for his glory, honor, and praise.
Amen.